I'm Ed Fries, and I'm here with my special guest, Ron Milner. We, we should celebrate Hello. Ron. <laughs> and we are going to tell you a story today. And um, what I would like to ask first is, this is based on a story I wrote uh, called Chasing the First Arcade Easter Egg. How many people in here have read that story? Like two. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> Because otherwise, it was just you were going to know this, but now, now I can tell you, and it'll be your first time. All right. So first, a, a little about us, a little about Ron. I was uh, uh, in 1973. I joined uh, Cyan Engineering, which was Atari's secret think tank in the mountains, and uh, worked there until 1985, when they dumped the nest and was in on. Most of the new uh, new things at Atari, uh, my my partner Steve Mayer and I uh, came up with the 2600, or what became the 2600. Uh, we did the prototype up there and started, uh, I guess, most of this industry that way. Uh, <laughs> Just a little thing you did. Did a, did a lot of did a lot of fun things uh, along the way. Uh, uh, talking Rats at Pizza Time Theater. We did the prototype of that, and uh, uh, hundred, hundreds of uh, interesting inventions along the way, from reinventing the wheel to uh, um, writing uh, computer games back then. <laughs> Which we'll get to, right? Yes. All right. A little about me. Um, I. Uh, well, I wrote my first games for the Atari 800 uh, back in 1982. I was a kid in high school working at a pizza place and wrote a Frogger clone. And somebody approached me and wanted to publish it. Uh, and you can still find those cartridges. They're made by an obscure company called Ramox. Um, so I always like to promote the collectability. They were, they were obscure? Yeah, yeah, oh, pretty I obscure. I thought they were mainstream. They were, that was Paul Terrell, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely was, yeah. I started a company with him. Well, I say they're obscure because they're hard to find on eBay. <laughs> you know. But... Um, Anyway, uh, I, for some reason, the entire game industry melted down in 1984 when I was in the middle of college. Um, and with it went Romox and my dreams of video game uh, stardom. And, and instead, I went to work for a little company called Microsoft. Um, I worked on Excel for five years. I worked on Word for five years. And then I got to do what I really wanted to do, which is get back in the game business. And I built and ran Microsoft's game business for, for the next eight years, including through launching the first Xbox. Uh, I retired uh, from Microsoft uh, when I turned 40 uh, uh, in 2004. And since then, uh, I work as a board member or advisor to lots of game and game-related companies. And I also do lots of kind of fun retro projects. Uh, because that's what I'm into. I love games and I love the whole retro scene. Uh, one of the games that I made uh, in 2010 was a game called Halo 2600, which a uh, few people know. Got to sign a few copies today. Um, but a few years ago, um, I, I acquired a space where I could have my own home arcade and I started buying a few pinball machines and a few arcade machines. And that kind of led me into exploring um, just uh, the early days of uh, video games. And um, so when I made Halo 2600, that was me kind of going back pre-Atari 800 to, uh, to that world. And then I just kind of kept going farther and farther back. And, and, and what really set me off was I bought a, a computer space, which was the very first arcade video game. Um, did, and Did it work? It did not work. It did not work at all. And so, um, I'm a programmer, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I had to learn a lot to bring this machine back to life. It had a tube TV, I actually had to merge two tube TVs together uh, to, to, to make the TV work, and then I had to fix the three circuit boards. And, and I did it, and I made it work, and I wrote, I wrote a story about it uh, on my blog called uh, Fixing Computer Space. Um, and, that, and I had so much fun doing it that I just started fixing things and then writing about it. And so I, 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 I fixed the first color arcade game, which, uh, which is called Color Gotcha. And then I was working on a story called Fixing Grand Track 10. Um, and I picked Grand Track 10 because I knew it had the first ROM ever used in a video game. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. This is 1974 when this game came out. It, it, it was first in many different ways. but. And you can go to my website, which is edfreeze.wordpress.com, and you can read this story. 
But while I was working on this story, I started interviewing the different people who worked on it. And basically, three people worked on it. Larry Emmons, Steve Meyer, and Ron Milner. Yeah. So I decided, I'm going to call these guys. And you know, I, I looked them up on LinkedIn, and I connected with them through, I got to one, and then they connected me to the next one, they got me to the next one. And finally, I'm talking to Ron. And, and Ron and I have an hour long or so conversation. And at the very end, he just kind of throws out um, that he had worked on this game called Starship One a few years later, and he put a, I think you called it a back door at that time. And he put this back door into it. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and, and then I'm sitting there doing the math in my head. I'm like, I'm not sure exactly when Starship One came out, but, but you know, uh, that was, that was a long time ago. Yeah. We, we, we designed it in uh, 76, although it, it didn't make the uh, MOA that year. It, it should have, uh, but uh, they were overloaded down in engineering in Atari and didn't get it out. We had completed it and uh, had an engineer up in Grass Valley who, who babysat it and made it work and took it down and into Sunnyvale. He became eventually the manager of Coinop Engineering, Dave Steuben. So I remember this game when I was a kid. I mean, uh, it looks like this. Maybe if you haven't seen it before, this, this will bring it back. But it was, it was a really unique and interesting game. I mean, you had a control yoke. You could, you could fly around in space, and you could shoot these things that looked just like things out of Star Trek. Um, it was first person. Uh, it, was, it was a cool game. Um, why don't you talk the, a little uh, about the game? Well, all, all the games before had been what we call a third-person game. You're looking down at a play field while watching tennis, or, or you're looking sideways at a, uh, a volleyball game. Um, first person is, is what you would see if you were in the game, and um, a lot, most of the games have, have become that way since then to, to give you that immersion. This was, this was a new thing when we did, did Starship to give you a feeling. And of course, with, you know, with the computers and the graphics that were available, we could all do some simple things. And Star, Star uh, Trek was our uh, <coughs> main TV show to watch. And of course, we looked at the star field and said, oh, we can, we can make a star field that, that grows like that and, and put a couple spaceships and we can make a first person game. So uh, I, I programmed that one and uh, I can't remember if I did the hardware, I think so. Uh, these were all, all pretty short projects, uh, like a month at the longest uh, that we would be immersed in things. So I get off the phone with Ron and I'm like, did he just say there was a, like an Easter egg in Starship? <laughs> and so I start to do some research real quick, you know, I'm like, okay, Adventure, you know, everybody knows about the Easter egg and adventure. Um, what actually what people don't know for sure is when adventure came out. I when I first put out the article, I said 1978, which shows up in some sources, and then this one guy just started telling me, no, it's 1980, it's 1980. I'm like, can I? Why, why don't I say 79? We'll compromise. He's like, no, it's 1980. So I put 1980 up here, so this one particular person will leave me alone. But it, 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 was, it was definitely written in 78, and when it actually was, was published, 79, maybe 80. But it has this famous Easter egg, which, which anybody who knows about Easter eggs knows about this. And you find this one little one pixel dot, and then you have to t take it through this little spot in a wall, and then it unlocks a spot where you can see the programmer's name. So. Okay, that's 1980, and, and so then I'm like, you know, <laughs> this is way before that. Maybe there's, well, I better look and see if there's earlier stuff. And I found this. This is a Channel F game from 1978. Uh, it's, it's called Video Whiz Ball. And, um, all right, that's close, but, um, but, but Clove is saying that, that um, Starship One is 1976. So it's, you know... Now, now I'm like, okay, this is, I'm, I'm going to, I got to put my little, you know, fixing Grand Track project on hold for a minute and, <laughs> and write about this because I think it's really exciting to write about, you know, discovery of a new Easter egg. And 
And that's when Ron and I started to work together on this project. Um, and so uh, this is a good time, I think, to pause and, and think and just ask you, what were you thinking? I mean, why? Because because you what what made you put this thing into the game? Well, programming was was really tough for me. This was the first game I programmed and and the last. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I'm a har I'm a hardware engineer. I understand op amps and 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 uh, sound and things like that. So programming a game was 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 pushing the limit limit for me. And I I was also kind of mischievous, and I wanted to I wanted to make a little twist. So after I had had the game basically working, I said, well, you know, what can I do? And I came up with the idea that. Yeah, I'll put something in there so that I can, I can uh, uh, show my friends that it was it was my game, and uh, I said, well, but I I can't do that because you know if they if they find it they'll fire me and I really like this job. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they'd fire you for a good reason, right? I mean. Well, as it as it turned out, uh, uh, the the Easter egg. Uh, the thing I, I wrote would give me 10 free games and put my name up on the screen. And uh, that, that would have been catastrophic if it had gotten out beyond our, our little circle because uh, uh, they'd have to you know, pay all these operators who were losing revenue actual quarters out in the field and change the games. Uh, I definitely would have been fired because I was on shaky ground with my boss anyhow because I was kind of a flake. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so good you were a flake because now we have this. Um, so, so when you and I first talked, you basically said, I put this thing in, I did it once 40 years ago, um, and then I forgot how to do it, basically. I, 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 forgot, I forgot completely. It was... What it was was an in, intricate series of uh, moves you made with the controls, and then and then just so that someone wouldn't randomly do that, you had to, had to drop a quarter at the right place in the sequence, to, and no nobody ever accidentally wandered into it, and I I kept the secret for 35 years till I I told Nolan and Bushnell about it a few years ago. He kind he kind of laughed. <laughs> And um, then I told Ed about it, but that's this is really the first time that it was that the story came out. I knew I, I knew I had to keep it secret. So you know, but, but of course I forgot how to work it. Right. So we have this story that that okay, there was some kind of Easter egg hidden in this game, but but we don't we're not sure how to get it. You know, frankly, I'm not I'm still a little skeptical. It's even there. You know, because there's no real evidence other than this guy I've only talked to once who says he put this thing in there. But, but he says, he, uh, and by the way, this slide, I'm just showing that the game actually came out mid-77. So July 77, I think, is the right date for, for the game. So he says to me, well, you know, if it, it, it says it, it puts high ROM on the screen. So I'm like, okay, great. We should be able to find the ROMs. We'll get them, you know, MAME has all the ROMs out there, we should be able to find the ROMs and find that high ROM. And I looked, and sure enough, there it is, high ROM. Okay, so we've got, we know that, the, the, we know that that text, high ROM, sits in the ROM. Okay, that's all we know. You know, what, what next? So then we kind of so, had to get to work, didn't we? <laughs> so so I, I had to remember about 6502 programming, and of course, there wasn't really any source code. There were there were disassemblers for this code, but uh, they of course didn't put any comments in. And even the original code that I wrote, I, I remembered carefully that where where I put this this code in, I I obscured it because I didn't want anybody of, at Atari who was looking at my code to to find this. We were we were Grass Valley, and it went down to Atari Production, so it it had to had to slide through scrutiny by, by real programmers there. So, so the, the, the high Ron was actually, I, I, took, I took high Ron and found the, the op codes that were uh, uh, and 6502 op codes. <laughs> and uh, 
Um, so it appears just as code, and I put some random comment that, that had nothing to do with anything, so, so it would slide through. So you couldn't have found it even if you had the comments, but chasing, chasing this thing was tough. Had to find the yeah. well, okay, we'll the get calls into that. and all that. We'll get into that. So, so we, we, we did have, so we had the ROM, which is basically a long list of numbers. Easiest way to think about it. We also had um, some decent schematics that are available from the from the manual, um, and um, and this part I'm showing here will, will become important a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. So the thing about the, the thing about assembly language is there's something called machine language, which is basically just a bunch of numbers, and then you can. And that gets created from something called assembly language, which is just kind of a, a, a sort of readable version of that machine language. Um, but you, what's good is you can go both ways. You can use, you use what's called an assembler to go from assembly language to machine language. You can use a disassembler to go from machine language or just basically a list of numbers back to assembly language. And so that's what we started to do. So first I just jammed the ROM into Stella um, into into the Atari 2600 uh, emulator because I that's what I play with sometimes and I just did a quick dump of that and I sent it to Ron and you you brought your friend Michael on at that point too right Michael Alba yeah I, I I asked him and he uh, uh, he didn't really uh, help me too much with it I mostly just uh, <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that but just spent some spent some time trying to crack the code and find the calls to everything and and uh, go backwards. Uh, it sure would have been nice if I'd had some commented code, but that disappeared years ago. And you, you sent me mail about a different disassembler. We played with that for a while. Ultimately, we got the best disassembly from, from MAME's debugger, which I don't, I don't have a lot of experience, and you don't either, with playing with MAME, but MAME actually has a really nice built-in debugger. And, we, and you can run the game on MAME, so why not just go break into the debugger in MAME and disassemble the code there? And that really helped us um, make some progress. And, and I sent big disassemblies to Ron. We knew where in memory that message hi Ron was, so we just needed to see where it was being referred to. Mm -hmm. and, and fortunately we had the, uh, we had the hardware map that uh, had all of, the, all of the switch inputs, so we, I was also looking for, for references to, the, uh, uh, to sampling the operator controls to because uh, uh, I remembered that you had to like jiggle the jiggle the fast switch and drop a coin the dropping the coin was the was uh, what got me the closest because the coin switch was well documented and and uh, by going into the coin routine I, I was able to, to more closely narrow in on calls to this uh, routine. Anyway, I, I was super impressed how, how quickly you were able to go back and look at code from 40 years ago. <laughs> and, I mean, and, and by the way, when you disassemble something, yeah, the code is now readable, but there's no names on anything. It's like, it, it's like if you were looked at code that had no comments in it and it just said variable one, variable two, variable three, variable four. Um, so there's no names for anything. So, so in, th in this case, I took something here that, that Ron sent me back, and he's, I, I he's wrote gone those. through. This is Ron created, all, you know, and, and he's, he's located the, the two critical sections in the code, and he's commented them. Um, and that's very helpful. So, so once, once Ron figured this out and sent it back to me, we still had to prove that it actually would work. And, um, and so I tried to do it in MAME, um, and, um, and I couldn't get it to work in MAME. I could go in, in the MAME debugger, and I could um, set breakpoints, and I could jump around the tests and make the tests work the way they needed to work, uh, and then I could get Hyron to show up. But I couldn't do it just using the controls on the keyboard, and it took me a while to figure that out. And, and the, the, the other part that was even more critical for me was besides saying hi, Ron, uh, it, it gave me 10 free games. Uh, so uh, the one time I used it, it, they had one of these at our county fair the, the, uh, right after it, it came out and, uh, and uh, went to the county fair with, with all my, my uh, close buddies from work, not my, not my boss, and, and I 
did the thing and showed them at the, at the fair that this thing would give me 10 free games that say, hi, Rod. And the, that was the only public exhibition of the <laughs> Easter egg ever. <laughs> and are there any programmers here? I, I can see at least one. OK, there's quite a few. So I have to, I have to fess up or they'll catch us. It's actually 10 hex free games, so which is 16 for you and me. So he's speaking in hex right now. But um, <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah. I, I don't, didn't yeah. remember that. Yeah, exactly. You can see it right there. Uh, number dollar, 10. Um, so anyway, um, at this point, I have to apologize. We were having technical difficulties just before the talk, and um, I can show you these videos after, but I have two videos in here of, of me reproducing the bug, the uh, feature, the Easter egg, <laughs> and neither one will show, unfortunately. So anyway, you're going to have to trust me. But first, anyway, blah, blah, blah. The, it turned out the problem with getting it to reproduce in MAME is the way that the, the MAME implementation of this game handled the, this thing that looks like a shifter on that picture. This, this thing here, uh, it's really just a button on the hardware. The button's either pushed or it's not pushed, but it was being treated as what they call a toggle in MAME. And so once I found, understood that and I, I switched it to be treated like a button, then I could reproduce it, which is a, a fabulous video that you're not going to see here. <laughs> that then makes Hyron show up on the screen. Let, let's let's tell these people how to do it in case they ever run into a Starship game. Absolutely, let's let's do that. <laughs> you're gonna so you're gonna go learn to a secret. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I, I did take take a quick look today. There's no Starship on the floor. Security, would you stand outside, please? <laughs> but basically. You know, the programmers can probably read this. Um, I'll try to translate. But basically what this says is um, you need to, to pass the first test, you need to put a coin in while holding down the start button and the phaser button, which is on the on the, the yoke. So it takes got, almost three hands, you, but you actually can do it with two. And I have a picture, I think, later of me trying to do it. But you're holding down one button. I do it like this, and then I'm, and I've got the yoke turned all the way, and I've got my other finger on that, and then I'm putting the coin in. And, but that's just to pass the first test. Then there's a little time delay, and during that time delay, you have to let up on everything, and then uh, push that slow, that gear shifter thing, from fast to slow, okay? Um, and that's the, what the second code says, is basically the slow button's pushed. What it doesn't say there is, and no other buttons are pushed, okay? So you're, put, you're, you're holding, you're kind of got your hand cramped, you're putting in this, this coin. You're trying to wait till the, you hear the coin go through the actual coin mechanism, you know? And, and, and then you can let up and then slam on this, <laughs> this gear shift to slow. All right. So that couldn't be easy because because if you watch kids in arcades, they're slamming the controls all the time when the thing's off. And, and but uh, this is why no one found this for yeah. forty years, right? <laughs> um, and and by the way, it's it has to be in the right of the, the the correct of the two coin slots. Okay, the left one. Thank you. So <laughs> so okay, I proved that I could do it in Maine. But what about the real machine? You know, I was starting to build up my arcade collection. This is a game I remembered, you know, from my youth. I was like, you know, I, this, I could add this to my collection. And, and if it does have the first arcade Easter egg, it would be even cooler to have in my collection. So I knew this uh, arcade dealer up in uh, Vancouver. Uh, they're called John's Jukes. And, and I called them up because I knew they had one of these for sale. And I, anyway, and I bought the machine. And they're, they're like, oh, OK, great. Let me, we'll just fix it up for you. We'll have it down to you in no time. Uh, we just have to do something with the monitor. You know, and then a week goes by, and they're like, oh, well, this monitor's still giving us trouble. Another week goes by, oh, this monitor is just like, we've decided to pull out that monitor and put in a different monitor. And anyway, it goes on and on and on. I mean, like a, a one month, two months, and I'm sitting there like, I'm, I, I really, I had this, it was just weird because I was like, on the one hand, I think this is, you know, totally obscure and nobody's going to find it and this thing's been a secret for 40 years. But on the other hand, I was like, what if somebody figures this out before I have a chance to write about it, you know? So I'm like, I'm like caught between these two things. But 
But finally they got it together to me, they, they sent, and they sent me the machine. Came all nice and wrapped up. I, I, I took it all apart, it was like Christmas Day, you know. I got my hand all cramped up, pushing, <laughs> pushing the button, you know. And I put the coin in, and I put the first coin in, and it goes clunk, clunk, and then it just, it stops. It doesn't go all the way through the coin mech. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, fine. The so mech I, was jammed. I open it up, and they, they had put this coin box in, but they hadn't put it in right, so the coin couldn't fall all the way through. So I take out the coin box, and it's like, okay, fine. So then I put in my next coin, I'm all ready, and I put in the next coin, and it goes clunk, clunk, and then it didn't, it didn't work. And, and then I figure out that this wire's broken to one of the coin mechs. And so then I, have, then I fixed that, fine, I got, I got stuff to fix arcade machines, I fixed that, and I'm all ready, and I put in a coin, and it goes clunk, a clunk, and nothing happens, it doesn't coin up. And so then I look, and this little, the little metal thing that, you know, that, that triggers, okay, so fine, so I fix the that. The wire on the micro the, switch. The wire the on the micro mech. switch, on the, thank you, on the coin mech. So I put that, okay, and then, so then I put it in the coin, clunk, 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 and it goes through everything, and the game just starts, and it doesn't do the high run. All right, and I'm like, okay, well, I probably did it too fast, and I do it again, and I'm like, okay, I'm doing it faster and faster, and fa okay, that's not working, I'm doing it slower and slower and slower, I'm waiting longer and longer for it to fall through. And I'm doing this for like, hour, <laughs> two hours, you know, and it's not working. And I'm like, how can it not work? I have the machine, I have, you know, God, maybe the ROMs are different than the actual shipping machine and what's in MAME, or maybe, I, I don't know. This was a secure Easter egg. <laughs> I, you know, and, and I go to, and I finally I give up, you know, my hand is cramped from doing this, and I'm like, and I go to, you know, I'm like, fine, I give up for the night, and I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm laying in bed at night, and I, I pull up the schematics, you know, this is the, you know, this is the kind of guy that I am, I read schematics in bed at night, and, um, <laughs> and, and I'm looking, I'm like, well, okay, let's just look, because I know that the code is looking at this one byte of information, and that byte is supposedly made up of these things, and it says phaser, spare, photon, torpedo, start, uh, uh, spare, spare, slow, coin, spare. But what are those spares? What does that really mean? You know, and so I'm looking through the schematic, and I find what I'm pretty sure is the, the circuitry that builds up that single byte. Because I see these things. I see phaser switch, and then I see photon, I see start, and then they're in the right place for the right bits in this switch. Okay? But then there's that circle um, below coin. Well, one thing I'm noticing is there's names on some of these that say spare, like coin two. It's not spare, it's coin two. Okay? But then I see one that doesn't say anything. It's that open circle, and I follow that wire over and it's connected to something that says bonus time, in quotes. And I'm like, bonus time, hmm, what is that? And right, right next to it, it says quad dip switch, okay? Well, this is a quad dip switch. I know what a dip switch is. Um, and the bottom of it says BT, you see that? Um, so anyway, as soon as I see this, I go, I think I know what it is. And you know, and I went to sleep. I slept very well that night. <laughs> and the next day, I go in and I flip the bonus time on the dip switch. And this is an operator setting so that you can turn on or off whether the game gives bonus time if you get above a certain score. Um, and that was the missing element. And as soon as I did it, I put the coin in, and it immediately came up high run. First try. And then I set up my camera. And, 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 gave, and gave him 10x free games. <laughs> exactly, 10x free games. Um, and then I did it again, and if my video was working, you could watch me right here uh, recreating it uh, on the real game. And so that was, that was great. And I immediately, you know, uh, sent mail to Ron and said, hey, it's published, worked. you know. And, uh, and finished writing up, and, uh, writing up the story on my blog and put it out like within a day or two. Um, I don't know if he you was, have anything he, you want to say about that right now. He, he, was, he was a total skeptic till, till the end. And, uh, um, I'm, glad, I'm happy you had the persistence to uh, uh, get through all the security that I built into it. <laughs> I don't know if I was a skeptic, but I didn't, I didn't want to get too excited. 
because I was pretty excited. You know, you ever get just too excited and then something doesn't happen, right? So I was trying to trying to be cool about it, I guess. But but once once it really happened, I knew, hey, this is the oldest known Easter egg. This is pretty exciting. I don't know. I was excited. Hopefully you're excited too because you're here. But anyway, so a little about the aftermath after I put it out. Um, I, my blog, first of all, I put about one or two stories up a year, so it's very, very, it's very low traffic, and they're really kind of thick, I mean, they're stories, but they have a lot of technical detail to them, which either you like or you don't like, I don't care, I write them, but, but. You, you are probably the only people who would like it. Thank you, thank you for that, I, uh, I appreciate it, I, 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 I know what, I know what you got, what you meant by that, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I'm not used to a lot of attention when I put up the story, but I put this story out, and um, and it actually, it, there was a bunch of headlines about it, and it was, you know, like, I mean, the story I wrote before this was about me discovering the first color arcade game, okay? The first color arcade game, and in that story, I put up the first pictures and the first video of the first color arcade game ever. Nothing. <laughs> but an Easter egg, woohoo! No, so anyway, anyway, a bunch of stories about the Easter egg. Um, just to give you an idea of the traffic on my website, <laughs> and that that little blip in June is when I put out the real story, which was about fixing Grand Track Ten, the first video, first racing video game, the first video game with a ROM chip, with first, first in a million different ways, way more important than the Easter egg, but. People love the Easter egg, so, <laughs> so there you go. So uh, the Easter egg got a bunch of attention. <laughs> um, and we got a fair number of comments, and, and this was my favorite. Um, this was a, a guy named Clay Cowgill, who many of you probably know if you're involved in the arcade uh, side of the world. He does uh, Williams Multicades and other modifications to arcade games. He's a super whiz. But apparently he also has access to some of the early Atari source code that somebody found and has saved. And they've been, I think they've been shy about publishing it because there's probably some questionable rights issues around it. Um, but Residual he, people who would, who would try to sue in general principles. But he posts this, and this is the actual source code for the actual stuff that we were talking about in the article. And it's interesting in a bunch of different ways. I mean, first of all, it's written in octal, not hex, which I feel for you that you had to work in octal. But um, uh, yeah, it is. So you don't, you're not remembering octal, apparently. No. But, um, <laughs> hex divides a byte into, into two four-bit nibbles, and each of those is described by a number 0 through f, 16 things. Uh, uh, octal divides it into two and a part, two three bit, uh, one three bit part, a second three bit part, and then you got two bits left over. And then you're doing it in numbers zero through seven. Anyway, we don't work in octal anymore. That's an old fashioned thing. But hey, octal. Second though, look at this thing at the bottom. Can you see that where it goes? Can you read that? You probably can't read that back there, can you? Okay. I can't read What it this there. is, this is total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but this code makes zero sense. And the reason, and, and look at the, first of all, this thing here, HIR is a label. I wonder what HIR stands for, hi, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a label, HIR, colon, and then several bytes of bullshit. Um, and the, but and, it's real op codes. And you put an RTS at the end, which I like. Like it looks like it look like it's a, it's a return a return from a subroutine. It all he's doing there is putting in code that will ter put the right bits, the right bytes in to spell Hyron. And he wants anyone who glances at it to say, oh, that's just some subroutine. Doing something weird. I can't tell what, but but um, but um, but that is Hyron encoded as. Bullshit, uh, I, I was a devious sucker. <laughs> anyway, that's the story. Um, do you have more you want to add before we go to questions? Uh, I would just say that the, the best part of Starship was the, uh, in the prototype there was a mag, uh, DC coil I put around the yoke of the TV to make the whole display rotate. When you rotated your display, 
the whole dis the whole display would rotate. And they decided that, that putting this coil around the outside of the yoke in the monitor was, was too expensive and, and hard, hard to service. And, and they took that out, so the display just sits there while you, while you turn. And uh, it wasn't as much fun. And, but they, they did do it in a, in a, in a later thing. That, that, was, that was technically my favorite part of it. Well, next time you're in Seattle, you can come over and mod my starship. Because <laughs> that sounds cool to me. That would make the game a lot it better. Was. Um, all right, that's, that's it for us. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> we got five minutes for questions. We got, we got nine minutes for questions. So what questions do you have about this Easter egg? Yes, go ahead. Uh, the report you, or the, the post you did about all this, the end of it, which one thing that was really cool is you said, I really hope this leads me to an even earlier Easter egg. <laughs> and I was just curious whether all the, the stuff that came out uh, led to anything that even gives you a hint that there might be anything else Easter egg-wise, either in arcade machines or any other kind of electronic toy. Yeah, I, you know, I don't have a hint. If I had a hint, I would probably be pursuing it, and I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> I actually, something really interesting happened based on one of my other stories yesterday, and I have something very interesting sitting in my hotel room here that I will write about in the next two weeks that I'm super excited about. But <laughs> it will, it will, be a new article on my on my site, um, but it will be a relatively short one because it's an update to something earlier. But I, unrelated to Starship. Un, but uh, unrelated to Starship. Um, the project I'm working on right now is Gunfight, which is the first uh, microprocessor arcade game. And so you kind of have to start from Gunfight, which is 75, and then work your way forward to Starship. And maybe somewhere in, in between there we'll find something. Thank you. Yeah. What is your site? It's, yeah, I know. It's like it's, that's why no one goes to my site. I, I keep it secret. <laughs> it's my name, edfreeze.wordpress.com. Discovery of any new Easter eggs manifested that are paying tribute to this, what is now known as the first Easter egg? Hmm, tribute. Tribute egg. <laughs> yeah, not that, not that I know of. I like that, though. Uh, hey, why don't should, you write one? Yeah, put one in. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bunch of programmers here. I like the tribute egg idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, you could put the whole game in as an Easter egg and something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, room isn't a problem anymore. I was, I was. That was one of the considerations when I put the thing in was to, was to see if there would be, you know, a, a very few bytes left because I, I couldn't s steal code from the ROM and everything was so tight and crammed that that getting the, uh, you know, getting the ten bytes extra was <laughs> was, you know, a problem. That's why I, that's why I put it at the very end so that you know if it ran over I would I would give up on. Uh, Oh, and uh, having it in there. Yeah, Halo 2600, best I could put in was Ed F. You know, that was, uh, that's all I had room for, three bytes. Yeah, go ahead. That leads me to another question. How long did you spend thinking about this? <laughs> uh, I'm sure it was somewhere between an afternoon and a day. <laughs> Were you asking how long he thought about it or how long I... Yeah, yeah, after mentioning about it. The creative thinking that had to go into finding out how to insert this. I'm just wondering how long. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the time frame. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Next. Look out room. Come on. One more good Easter egg question. Yes. How do people pass information around about how to find the Easter eggs? What would you say? You know, word of mouth? And... Yeah, I've seen some websites. There's like some Easter egg hunter guy. Who who looks looks for Easter eggs? I'm just thinking back originally back in the 80s and everything. Oh, you're saying like how would it get out? <laughs> well, if it got printed in something, that was. We, I mean, we did have bulletin boards. People forget about that, but we, even yeah, though we didn't like yeah. that's how my game, my frog froggy game, got around when I wrote it in 1981. It was you know it it went out on a bulletin board and then. I mean, especially games. Games were pirated. I mean, certain game programmers were even known to break copy protection in other people's games. Certain. <laughs> 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 yeah, of course. Um, I was curious about 
Um, so you're looking at the source code, or you're programming the source code. You're putting effort in to obfuscate the source code so that it isn't obvious that there's an Easter egg. But um, it would take someone very technical to even interpret that at all. So if, if the company in general is afraid of non-approved things happening with source code, there's got to be someone who's very technical who's also willing to, or, you know, that is willing to, to squash your efforts as well. It's just that seems Well, you had a technical manager you worked for, right? Well, I, I, I had an engineering manager. He's the one I would be scared of firing me, but uh, the, we had an engineer uh, who was, was hired in particularly to take this project down to Atari, uh, Dave Steuben, and uh, I, I was a lot worried that Dave would find it because he understood, understood programming, and uh, uh, I couldn't let him know about it because he was there in the Atari culture, and he would have have taken it out and gotten me fired. And, but uh, Dave turned into a really good friend over the years. <laughs> yeah, it's different and different. I mean, we used to put Easter eggs in uh, every version of Excel and Word that I worked on. And it was, we had kind of a funny policy about it. Like, you could have the code. It would be like, you know, Easter egg dot C, you know. Um, but but what you couldn't have was the way the code got, ex got called. So even a very good programmer would look through and you would have a very hard time seeing. You'd see these functions, but they would never be called. And so that was, that was our bizarre policy, as long as there was no, <laughs> no way to call it. You know, we, we were covered, you know. Yeah? Um, I kind of have two questions. Is there somewhere where you can go watch the video? Of yes, edfreeze.wordpress.com. Okay, so you will see the videos. <laughs> my other question is, has this been like, I guess authenticated with like Guinness World Records, like it's the earliest Easter egg found in that video game. Who Guinness? Yeah, that's let's a good, go for Guinness. That's a good question. <laughs> they do they do do a gamer version of, of Guinness, which I've been in for other random stuff, but they they have not contacted me for this. Um, I I you know I would love to have an earlier one be found. I think that would be super cool. I hope I hope people here get excited and go uh, <laughs> look look for an earlier one. Stop looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chris. So you put Easter eggs into Word and Excel. Has have all of your Easter eggs been discovered? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. One was based on a dream I had. I actually had, I, I I had a I had a dream and in the you know, we were just. 100% focused on, on defeating Lotus 1, 2, 3. Lotus was bigger than all of Microsoft at that time. And, and I had this dream, and in the dream there was a box of Lotus 1, 2, 3, and it started shaking, and then, and then it just burst open and bugs all crawled out. And, and, and uh, so I, I wrote, you know, me and some other people, yeah, we turned that into a little, little animated thing, and that's, that's one, of the, one of the Excel Easter eggs. Um, but I've never seen that one uh, reproduced. It's out there. Now All right. Go back and try it. Yeah, go find it. <laughs> All right. We are, we are out of time. Thank you so much.